Let's talk about avoiding getting boxed in. Actually, last night I was just teaching like a, a youth group all about cycling. And we were talking about like how cycling is a chess match and you make your moves with energy and it's finite and it's so complex and that's what makes it so fun. But this is what makes bunch sprints so hard. Like it, they're not simple <laughs> and, and they're there. And it's not just who has the strongest sprint. Like, even though that's, you know, kind of like the, the common assumption, but a lot of it is like intuition and Ivy having raced, you know, pro and raced on the road and ton of this stuff. I'm sure you noticed that from beginning to where you are now, what was the intuition process of building like for you? How long did it take? It took forever. <laughs> like <laughs> if, I feel like, um, you know, a lot of, uh, cyclists, um, in Amber and I's field, like it's, it's pretty easy to get like the fitness part, like pretty quickly, just like mm -hmm. we're great at it. We can get fit super quick and learning that intuition of how to navigate a bunch sprint, like in whatever field you're in, um, takes years and years and seasons of consecutive racing to perfect. And, you know, like Pete is saying, there are like scenarios in which you need to like prepare for how a race can shake down. Um, but ultimately even the most seasoned sprinters, I mean, mistakes all the time. Um, and it's important to be super kind and gentle to yourself in that process and like understanding that it's going to take years to figure out. And that process of sharpening those skills in itself can feel super rewarding. Is there That's so it, true? It takes patience. Sorry, go ahead, Amber. Yeah. <laughs> this is not something that you can hack. <laughs> this is, yeah. this is, um, because every race that you're in, it ends up being different. There's something different about it. So it's extremely rare that you're going to ever find yourself in exactly this situation ever again. There will be something about it that's different. So every race that you do, the more you can learn and absorb from that in terms of principles, the better, because then you kind of have this database in the back of your brain. So when you're evaluating every new scenario that arises, you're thinking about it from um, experience and principles. And all of those over time are what will create your race intuition so that you don't have to think about it really. You can just react more in the moment and your reactions and your intuition will be more aligned with what's needed in the moment. But really it's about gleaning as much as you can from every experience, because then you'll be able to apply that more dynamically in changing circumstances and in, in new races in the future. Mm. One thing I want to clarify with this too, just to be like super clear with this, what we're talking about is screwing up a lot. Like <laughs> yeah. that, that's the process, like not getting it figured, like missing the mark, not doing it right. And then that's where the patience comes in is being okay with the, and, and being understanding and kind with yourself and saying, Hey, it's okay that I didn't make it this time. I'm learning. Every race is a learning opportunity. And that's why it is a really good strategy to race as often as possible. I know Pete, like for you, like when you were in your college days, like you would have raced six times a day if you could have every day. <laughs> for sure. No for every, every single day I would have. Yeah. Um, and I, that's actually, it's perfect that, um, both Amber and Ivy said this, that it's, there's 1000 things that you could do differently every time in the last two laps or one lap, let's call it a thousand things. So not only are you paying attention to what worked and what didn't work, but what came before that and what came after that and how those influenced those other decisions again. And so that's why when you run the scenarios, like a race is, uh, you could run it a million times and it would never be the same. And so you have to be able to take like nuggets that you can apply in more races than just this one. And then also be able to look at the information that happened and be like, nope, this was actually a one-off time just for this race. And I shouldn't change my behavior based on this one thing. So it's really, that's why being a one, like the best sprinters in the world are only there for a couple of years, probably. And it took them five years to get there or 10 years to get there. Um, it's so, so complicated. Um, and I think that's, that's why you want to race as much as you can, because then you get more feedback and more information in the system every single time. Um, but definitely try to logically think about what you did, what you did correctly, what you did incorrectly and how those impacted you one another, um, mm. which is difficult. This is why we have so many race analysis videos about positioning. If you look at that, whether it's Amber, Keegan, uh, Pete, Sophia, like, we have all these athletes talking about positioning, positioning, positioning over and over. 
and and it's like a there there will come a strange point in your evolution as a cyclist where you start to realize like oh i'm like i'm not caring as much about my max power output or putting down a really picturesque big sprint instead i'm just constantly focusing on positioning and when you really start to focus on that that's where you start to i feel like really make uh, improvements and pete you've taught me a lot about positioning whether it's you telling me about it or just watching you race you are really really good it's almost like um like pete and i very social very like you know chatty sort of like yeah, that's our relationship when it comes down to the end of a race pete is not pete is very focused and he has a task that he's working on and it's positioning and you're mm -hmm. really good at it i constantly see you working at it it's it's yeah, a strength of yours i think i definitely and, and i honestly that's probably half of the reason i'm as good of a racer as i am is because that is something that clicks really well with my brain and it's like this fun efficiency game where how little how little energy can i use to be in this position versus this position versus this position um and i'm lucky that i like that and it somehow it's fun to sit sit on someone's wheel and think about how much energy this is costing but um i know not everybody is that way uh one of the things that i think is interesting in a sprint especially and i'll i'll be the first one to say i'm not a very good sprint positioner, even for myself, I know some laws that I should abide to. Um, and I think one of the things that a lot of people have a really hard time with is getting comfortable in the front of a race during the last lap or two, because it's, it's pretty much terrifying. Like, um, yeah. for al almost all races, even if it's a pan flat, like six lane highway, um, where you're going 30 miles an hour, it's still scary and people still crash and things still happen. So one of the things that you can think about is if you're in control of your movement and you're always moving yourself forward, you're like fighting upstream in the race. So you're always leaning forward into the race and trying to, um, like advance your position. So you're never, ever going back. You you're in control and you're going to feel much more comfortable around the around the people next to you because you're advancing as soon as you're getting advanced on and people are coming around you you're no longer in control of the situation mm. and it gets 10 times scarier 100 times scarier because all of a sudden you're not in control and you're not putting your handlebars in front of other people's handlebars and you can get pinched and pushed and stuff like that so for people who are just trying to get into the sprint who have never dipped their toes into the water find like one of the sides one of the front sides and use too much energy to keep yourself at the front and just get familiar with what that feels like. Because once you're more familiar with what that kind of the pressure required on the pedals and like mentally to keep yourself forward and to keep yourself with everybody, um, then you can start thinking about racing too. But initially it's the only thing you can think about is just staying there and not how to win the race. It's just like, okay, I'm gonna try to sit third or fourth or fifth wheel and that's it. And then that's my victory for the day. All I have to do is stay there for some amount of time. It might only be 30 seconds. It might be a lap and that's okay. Right? Like that's, that's a, that's a victory in itself. And you learn a new skill and it made you a better racer. Mm. There's uh, the part of this too. There's a predatory instinct that kicks in <laughs> the reason that once you get past once and you move back, then you keep moving back. I'm sure you've noticed this Ivy and Amber, when you see a rider ahead of you and that rider just got passed instantly in my mind, it's like that rider's going back. I can get around, I can get around them too. I'm going to get around that person. It's like you, you like, there's like blood in the water and that's moving back. And if they move back, you're like, I can move ahead of them too. I, am I the only one feeling this or have you, have y'all felt this too? <laughs> okay, good. Yeah. I'm not alone. Okay. Yeah. 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 Embarrassed nods. Um, because that's something that in, in the end of the race, you're taking in so many cues. And like Pete said, just practicing riding at the front like that and holding that third wheel position, whatever it is, is really good at getting yourself used to that. Because then it alleviates the pressure of sprinting at the right time, having the speed to sprint, the danger of the sprint, everything else like that. It's a really good way to, to make sure that you're used to those demands beforehand. Let, let's, let's kind of focus in on like mistakes in the last kilometer though, in general, like Ivy, do you have like in, in your learning through racing, what mistakes are regularly made by all of us cyclists that you would advise us on avoiding? Sure. Um, well, uh, I think the most important thing to understand about how the last few laps or the last kilometer of a race can shake down is that you're not in control. 
like, even if you have like, you know, you still have five teammates and a whole, like a huge lead out left, like you're not going to be in control. And like so much of what Pete mentioned about like all of these things changing around you in the race, like you're not going to be able to control that either. And so like fighting to stay in that top, whatever position you determine is like your goal, um, isn't just working to hold that position. It's constantly moving. And so, um, and it's not necessarily going to be like, Oh, I'm at the back of this group. Like, let me just do one big, enormous effort. That's a minute and a half long and get to the front of this race. Like that's a, you know, that's a huge mistake to make. Um, and so a lot of it is just like that intuition of learning, like to follow some other dum dum that's going to do that for you and like getting a free ride or just like moving up one position. And, you know, a lot of that too, like a big mistake you can make when you're doing that is not learning how to safely command your space when you're working for a position. And that in itself is a sub skill um, that will take mm. years and years and seasons to safely and confidently perfect. Oh, wow. Yeah, that's super true. That's a, um, and that's like a subtle thing, right? I, I, Amber, like you've mentioned going over to Europe and dealing with like, it felt like it was a different sport all of a sudden, like every, you know, everyone was on bikes, but there is like, there is subtlety to that where athletes can, when an athlete belongs there and feels they belong there because of the experience they've accrued and their self-belief, they do race differently and it's not overly aggressive. It's just they own that space. I, and I don't, I'm not sure really how to break that down. Um, that's it, but well, that's a yeah. really good point, Ivy. Yeah, I just had I think... like a, Oh, I just had a flashback of like European writers that like really command their space. Like they will put <laughs> their hands on you. Like if they want your wheel, like it's crazy. <laughs> well, this goes back to what you were saying, Jonathan, about the writer that you see getting passed ahead of you. And then you think, Oh, okay. I can get around that writer. Well, that happens throughout the race, actually, not just in the last K. And by mm. the time you get to the finish, you've been racing with these folks for a whole race. And you have a really good idea of the people who are super solid wheels and who are likely to be moving up and motivated to move up and have the skill to move up and do it safely. And you've already probably picked out a few wheels that you really want to avoid because maybe they're not trying to move forward and they do keep getting pushed back or maybe they're a little bit squirrely. So when you get to the finish, you already know everyone in the field kind of knows, all right, that person, you know, maybe it's one of the European riders in the peloton, like mm -hmm. you don't want to fight that person for a wheel and not because they're dangerous, but because they own and command their space. And you know, that if you kind of get into a chicken fight with them, you're probably not going to win. They're not going to mm -hmm. put anybody at risk by doing this, but you establish yourself throughout the whole race. And if you establish yourself as somebody who's not going to open up a gap, somebody who's going to be solid through the corners, who's not going to be putting anybody at risk, people are going to be a little bit more okay with letting you hold the wheel that you want. But if you're mm. somebody who's constantly getting passed and pushed back in the field, nobody's going to feel comfortable being behind you and they're all going to want to move around you. And again, that is a skill that you need to work on a little bit over time, but just keep in mind, and this can play in your favor as well, because you can identify the people who are really good at moving forward, who are super solid, who you feel safe around. And those are the wheels that you want to be following in the finish of a race. Um, hmm. one way that you can work on this is to know that again, the, your, your handlebars and your front wheel are the most vulnerable part of the space that you occupy. If somebody hits you on the hip or even touches your rear wheel, all of that stuff is really safe and stable, but your handlebars can pivot as can your front wheel. So if somebody hits your handlebar, or your front wheel, that pivoting motion is the thing that makes you more vulnerable. So you don't have to worry so much about who's behind your handlebars, but you do need to worry about where your front wheel is and where your handlebars are. And, um, I think that focusing on that really helps because it's, it, it alleviates a lot of stuff that you don't have to pay attention to. And a good way of doing this as an exercise in a race is just to think to yourself, I need to move up. I need to move past two handlebars. Like that always feels pretty doable, right? Like I can move past one set of handlebars and another set of handlebars that feels mm -hmm. doable. And because the race is so dynamic, sometimes you might be all the way at the back and you only need to move past two handlebars, two handlebars, 
and you're at the front of the race again. And I think that breaking it down into smaller bite-sized little things like that can help because if you get pushed toward the back of the race and you're like, Whoa, I'm so far away from the front. I'll never get back there again. That mental space can be really debilitating. But if you just say, yeah, okay. Two handlebars, two handlebars. And that helps you make these little smaller, subtler movements where you're not having to blast up the entire side of the Peloton. And doing that is how you do what Pete and Ivy, Ivy have been talking about, which is constantly moving forward, leaning into and moving, you know, th upward through the stream versus getting pushed back and mm. don't give up. If you get pushed back, keep pushing forward. Okay. Someone passed you move past two handlebars, move past two handlebars. And all of that will help you command your space and help moving forward. And that's a really good focus drill to work on uh, as far as positioning goes. And I think that you can learn a lot from doing that. Mm. There's something too with this where, <clears throat> so Pete, you've mentioned this before, taking it one set of handlebars at a time, kind of just like little by little by little. And I think that that's a really helpful thing to do is to just step up like that. Um, and something keeps get, getting brought up and it's that move of desperation, I would call it, that an athlete does toward the end. And it's either because it's too complex and mentally overwhelming. So we just choose strength. And so we just go, just push hard on the pedals and sprint and we'll get there. Or it's a situation where we've worked ourselves into a situation where we feel like we're so disadvantaged that we're frustrated. And then we do the thing that we absolutely shouldn't do, which is instead just use up all of our energy in one blow. That's never going to work. However, in the moment it makes sense to us and we do it and we see it <laughs> all the time. And it's even like, if you watch the USA crits, um, those races are really interesting to watch. You'll see riders do this move of desperation, even professional athletes. So the shows, everyone does it, but they'll do this toward the end of a race. And then you'll see a team that's really like trying to control and patrol the front. When they see those moves of desperation, they do not worry. They recognize those and they let that athlete burn up. It's like, like you know, bouncing off on re-entry, right? Like they're going for it, going for it. And they're just not even going to be able to make it back in <laughs> where you're like, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm ready to, to do a good job. And I'm ready to race. I'm ready to sprint. I think I can win this race. But then you get into the scenario of positioning. Positioning gets difficult. Like in this scenario, you're at the back corner. There's a group in between you and where you want to be. You're so far away from it. So you just decide to go resist that temptation at all costs. If instead what you can do is say, how can I improve my position right now? That, and remember improving your position, isn't just riding fast next to a group, right? That's, <laughs> that's bad because you're in a, a bad spot. Anyway, you aren't sheltered and then you've lost all your energy, but instead just focus on being super efficient, doing those micro movements. And that's what it feels like. It feels like you're constantly, like if you stop, you're on an escalator going down. So mm -hmm. you, you constantly have to keep stepping up and going against that escalator when that's what it feels like. And right when you feel like you've got it and you're into perfect position, it won't last because like Ivy mm -hmm. said, there's so many things out of your control. So it's being committed to that constant like iteration of like where you are. And now I need to do this, need to do this, need to do this constant improvement with that. So it's, it's a really it's, and man, once you do it, it feels great when you figure that out because it's, it's just so cool. You get to the finish and you're actually fresher and you can sprint well, or you get to a spot where you realize I just won that race and I didn't even get close to my peak power. I didn't even need to. It just feels so awesome when you can win a race on efficiency like that. It's, it's just really cool.